welcome to another episode of Grief Talk. Everything you want to know about grief and more. I'm your host, Vaughn Solis. As an author, mentor, and bereaved mom since 2005, through guest interviews and coaching, here's where you'll always get great content that is inspiring and practical to help you heal after loss. Today's guest is Michelle Ann Collins. After losing her husband to suicide and experiencing other losses, as an author of two books for spouses of suicide loss and those supporting them, and the founder of Inhabit Joy, Michelle works with the grieving to help them reclaim their wholeness and build resilience for life's inevitable challenges. As a certified grief educator and grief yoga instructor, Michelle combines the tools she's learned as a wellness coach and from her studies in positive psychology, neuroscience, and spirituality to turn post-traumatic stress into post-traumatic growth and resilience to help her clients thrive. Okay, so welcome to the podcast, Michelle. I'm absolutely delighted that you are here with me today. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So for the audience, um, as I introduced Michelle in the intro, uh, she uh, did lose her husband to suicide uh, and has experienced other losses. We're going to be opening up with that and a conversation completely around how Michelle uh, dealt with that, how it impacted her, what she has done since then to uh, do the work she does today uh, to help the grieving. And it's going to be a jam-packed, filled conversation. And uh, we're going to have lots of fun in this one. Some serious stuff too. Let's go, Michelle. So um, wanting to start right away with the loss of your husband to suicide. You and I have talked briefly uh, prior to the podcast, and I said to you, I don't think there's enough uh, support uh, or understanding of support for spouses. Uh, We've had some uh, high-profile spousal suicides in the last year, Twitch, I'm thinking of, actually. And when we have these, uh, you know, celebrity uh, ones a few years ago, Mick Jagger's uh, partner, uh, well-known designer, took her life. We had uh, Kate Spade take her life, you know, Robin Williams going back even more uh, further. And so, in my opinion, that's kind of what brings attention to, oh, suicide. But then the spouses get lost in all of that, the partners, So how about we just open straight up with that and you share what you would like to uh, with my audience uh, who may also be impacted by this watching uh, this episode because this is what it's geared to today, audience, and uh, share whatever you'd like about uh, your partner, uh, your husband's suicide, how it impacted you. Okay, thank you. Um, Suicide is so stigmatized that when you lose someone to suicide, there's all this extra guilt and shame that surrounds the loss that isn't necessarily part of any other kind of death. Although there is usually guilt when you lose someone. Yeah. But there's this extra layer of what could I have done? You know, if someone dies from cancer, you pretty much don't take responsibility like, oh, I should have seen the signs or something like that. So when my husband died by suicide, I had had a suicide in my family before about maybe 20, 15 years earlier, my uncle. Um, But it wasn't as impactful, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, But I did I did witness the and it was it was sort of swept under the family rug. We didn't talk about it very much. Mm -hmm. Nobody went to therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I knew about suicide and I knew there were suicide awareness, um, groups and that kind of thing. My husband was military. So a lot of our, he was retired. A lot of our, uh, you know, some of his buddies had died by suicide by the time he left. And it was, so it was talked about a little bit, but not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. And then the separate part of losing your spouse, um, when you lose your spouse, your whole world changes. I mean, your, your checking account, your, you know, maybe your living situation, your identity, certainly oftentimes where you live, um, Mm -hmm. all of these things. So after my husband Glenn died, I was really in a tailspin for quite a long time. I 
ended up developing PTSD because of the trauma of the the death and mm-hmm. the time surrounding the death because uh, you know sometimes suicide comes out of the blue in my case he had been threatening and uh, very unstable for the weeks and months leading up to the suicide and so we had separated because he had become really irrational mm-hmm. uh, so that added another layer of guilt you know yeah if only if only, if only. Yeah. So the big work after a suicide loss is, you know, stop shooting on yourself. The coulda, shoulda, wouldas. Mm -hmm. That's the big work. Yes. Once they're gone, you can't change it. So the big work is, okay, here I am now. How do I make a new life from the ashes of this experience? No kidding. Um, can I just ask a couple of questions and only answer what you'd like to? Uh, When did this loss uh, happen and how long were you married? We were together just under two years, married about 20 months. Okay. And it happened in April of 2016. Okay. Yeah. So the reason I asked that is because um, um, I think I think putting a, a time, you know, people are always asking, well, somebody just reminded me this the other day who was on, uh, who works in grief and, you know, how long is the grief going to last? She's also uh, widowed. Well... Who knows? It's different for everyone. And, and so, you know, if you, you've had years with this, few years with this. And the process does change if we allow it to change. Um, but I also just want to acknowledge and point out that, um, well, I want to ask you this, actually. The fact that you weren't together for years and years and years, did you feel any... I don't know if the word would be stigma, but let's say judgment around the fact and or have had even comments. Well, you weren't together very long. You'll find someone out like that because other people, you know, might be in the exact same situation. And that's a problem all of its all of it on, on its own, don't you think? Yes. And first, I want to I want to speak to the question, how long will I grieve? And David yeah. Kessler, my my um, guru <laughs> in yep. life says, well, how long will your loved one be dead? Which I think is a little intense, but it's true. You're always going to miss them. Yeah. And as far as the short time we were together, it was very, very intense. I mean, we we met and a week after our first date, we knew we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. I mean, he literally proposed after we had known each other one week. Yeah. It was really intense. We were yeah. love blind. It was it was yeah. crazy intense and yeah. And it was crazy, I have to admit. Well, I I got engaged after t- after 2 weeks of meeting my husband, but this is back before we had internet. Uh really. And we've been married uh, 32 years together, 33. So it does, it does happen. So what I, what the reason I'm asking you about this and we're talking about this a little bit is the time you're with a person uh, who dies by suicide, whatever your relationship is, has no bearing on the impact of that suicide. Uh, and I just want you to really understand that because I would think there's an awful lot of guilt that uh, accompanies uh, people feeling, well, I didn't know them that long. I wasn't married to them. They were just a friend. They were just a colleague. So what I just want to, you know, do give a quick nod to here is, is I have met people who lost a friend in middle school to suicide and in their 40s or 50s or even older still feel guilt about it and have been very, very impacted. So that is the message I just want to get across here. And I also wanted to say from one suicide loss of survivor to another, of course, I am extremely sorry that you've had to have this experience as well. Uh, I'm a bereaved mom of a child suicide, so um, I get it. I get it. And and so we're, we're just acknowledging that, like, you know, that I, I do know after 18 years in this that there are similarities in how we um, are impacted by suicide. So you say you had developed PTSD. Yeah, me too. And I, I just wasn't diagnosed for nine years. So that did a number on me. So I advocate for people being aware how the trauma has impacted them as well. Uh, some may, people may get PTSD. Many others may not. But guaranteed, we're all traumatized. 
So I also want to make I also want to make that point. And there are many deaths that don't come with trauma. Yeah. Most deaths come with grief. Yeah. Not all come with trauma. Almost exactly. all suicide losses come with trauma. So you have a really complex yeah. situation. Yeah. There's going to be trauma for somebody. And the ripple effect, the World Health Organization has lots of research on it, as do other organizations. But guaranteed, it isn't just the family impacted by a suicide. Um, and as we change in grief also, we're not there for the people who knew us the way we were. And that causes its own grief too. So um, just giving a nod to that. All right. So your husband, obviously it's a shock and he takes his life. What I did find interesting though, and what you said is that he had been talking about it. And um, is that kind of rare? Like I, I read that of all of the people, this is coming from psychiatrists uh, who uh, express uh, suicidal ideation or even mention it, uh, eight to ten percent on average, eight to ten percent actually carry through with it. And I've met more people where they've never said a word. They've kept it, and especially our kids, maybe told their best friend, which my daughter did. Um, that's it, but not like I'm doing it tomorrow at you know whatever. So was that unusual, or is this um, something that I, I I'm not sure how I want to phrase this. So I want to be very delicate here. But it was a military death. And when I spoke earlier about certain deaths, military is another one where we talk more openly about suicide. In fact, in the DSM-5, they point you to Veterans Affairs, you know, uh, for understanding suicide. They speak a lot about U.S. Veterans Affairs. So is the talking about it, in just in your experience or anything you may have learned um, kind of more, more, I don't want to say common, but more prevalent for the military because there are a lot of military suicides, right? Yeah. I think in the last several years, it has really blown open. You know, there's a, there's an organization that I donate to and volunteer for that's called Stop Soldier Suicide. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of other organizations that are completely focused on military suicide loss yeah so we need more yeah you know, as one of my passion projects but there is definitely more talk about it i think there's a difficulty at least and this is just you know i only have experience with one yeah but it, what i noticed Hot. when one of glenn's friends died by suicide just maybe a year before he did maybe 10 months before i noticed that he at he he was aware of it. Like he saw it, the announcement on Facebook and a, a group he was in with mm -hmm. his uh, military buddies. But he barely told me about it and he never talked about it. And none of them talked about it. So so what we need is to figure out a way to reach these soldiers and let them know it's okay to talk about it. I think the incongruity the, the difficulty that they need to overcome is soldiers are supposed to be really freaking tough, right? And yeah. They're defending our, our country, they're defending our freedom, oh. they're putting their lives on the line and fight. Yeah. And now we're supposed to get them to talk about their feelings. So I think that's part of the, the disconnect and why we're losing so many of these guys and, and women too. But so many of our soldiers, because... Talking about your feelings and being a soldier don't necessarily come together. So, so that's where the work is is happening, and it is happening. That's good. We are saving lives, and there's also a project called the Black Box Project that I just mm -hmm. saw in some big newspaper. It might even have been New York Times, or um, and the Black Box Project is taking soldiers' um, electronic lives. You know, their their phones, their emails, their online um, social media yep. after they die and looking through it to see if there are any patterns that can be recognized that might be able to be seen in the future to, um, you know, intervene. And I think that's a brilliant project. And, and I've been helping out with that one as well. Yeah. Wow. Like if they might be communicating to others, researching, 
uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's been going. It's been going on a long time. Actually, when my daughter uh, died in 2005, she was 22. She was very tech savvy, very. And she was doing things long before, making apps and stuff long before it became popular. But back then, as I said, oh, yeah. yeah, back then, we didn't really have internet as we know it today. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have, you know, groups. We didn't, we just didn't have social media. And um, the police confiscated her computer. No. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. And so the reason I'm telling you that and being honest is because this was going on 18 years ago and probably longer than that and did find a pattern of her visiting these uh, dark websites and um, they would not, they wiped it. So when they gave the computer back two months later, that information was gone. But at the time, one of her friends got me into another site so I could just sort of look and, um, you know, I guess he got me in on what would be a proxy today and just look, I'd never became a member and it was um, one of a few probably that were available back then. So imagine how many would be available now. Back then, though, it was only like chat in a community, just messaging. And there were a lot of professional people on there. There were doctors. There were medical professionals saying, this is how you would do this. If you want to go this way, this is what you would need. Certain drugs, certain, anyway, I don't want to go into detail, but you name it, any, any, any type of question posed as to what would be the success rate. People were looking for the success rate. And I saw as young as about 15, although the site was only supposed to be like, I think it was 18 and up, you know, obviously I was searching to see if I had, could find evidence of my daughter being on that site, which I could not. Um, and it's probably just as well I didn't find it. But, you know, that for sure would have contributed, for sure contributed to her death. And um, so just pointing that out. So this black box project, I don't know what they're going to do with it after the fact, except address maybe the cry. What are you saying? Why don't you want to be here? Things like that. I think that's amazing. And then do it maybe for the military, and then let's do it for everybody. So um, just going back quickly, um, I don't want to dwell on this for you at all, but were you worried about Glenn? Like, did I did you, I hear you right? And you said that he had said a few things about it that concerned you. But hindsight's everything, right? Right. Well, no, I mean, he, he told me his plans. He told me his specific plans. He bought, he purchased a gun, uh, and I, okay. I actually made him return it. Uh, and this was four months before he died. So this had been going on and we were, we were doing the work. We were, you know, taking him to therapy, taking him to, you know, he, I, I was a yoga, well, still am a yoga instructor and, you know, yoga, meditation, all of the things that can help with mental health. Yeah. Uh, and he just was spiraling and not able to stay uh, rational or or functional. And we we tried. I mean, we, we did everything. And then when he got to the point where I was starting to fear him, uh, for my, I was fearing for myself, for my own safety. That's when I had to ask him to move out. And it was really, really hard because even though he had said he was no longer planning uh you know, I only heard about it in December and he moved out in March. Mm -hmm. He never mentioned it again. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know he was talking to someone else about it. One of his uh, people that he was spending time with uh, mm -hmm. after he had moved out from mm -hmm. our home. And she is the one who the day that he died, sent me a message on Facebook and said, I can't get a hold of Glenn. Can you go? He had moved into an apartment just a, like okay. two blocks from our home. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you go check on him? Yeah. And up until then, I was really trying to believe he was telling me that he was telling me he was okay. He was telling me he was doing, wow. you know, all this great stuff and not doing things that were self destructive. But I found out after he died that he was not truthful towards the end of his life with me. And after his friend called, uh, to tell me, called me on Facebook to tell me that she couldn't get a hold of him. I went to the apartment and I, 
found him. You're the one that found him. Well, it's no wonder you have P- it's no wonder you have PTSD. I, I mean, honestly, that's just a heck of a lot. And as you were talking, our situation was actually kind of similar. Couldn't get hold of my daughter, and you know, I, it, it's still really sensitive for me. So I don't like to think about that day. Although I can think about that day every minute, just like I'm sure you can, clear as a bell. But the same thing. So I I found out that she was uh, gone on uh, on the way in from our home in the country to the city. And I had to avoid the highway for, oh my God, at least a year. I couldn't, year and a half. It took me, oh, three, four, five years before I I could get on the highway and not feel traumatized by that, you know, because our memories. I am not to end that. I know, I know you do. I know you do. So like, just, I'm just like, wow. And I'm a suicide loss survivor audience. And for you also watching or listening to this that are suicide loss survivor, like that's a lot that you're dealing with and had to deal with, Michelle. That is a lot, a lot. Uh, And there were a lot of, that's a lot. There were a lot of things like you were mentioning earlier about our our relatively short relationship. And there were a lot of things that made me feel disenfranchised. Um, his, yeah. his military buddies, uh, thank goodness they rallied around his kids, oh. but they also rallied around his ex-wife and not me. Yes. I was not included in the military gathering. Uh, really? He was. Wow. Because we were separated. Mm. They basically just assumed that meant I didn't care for Glenn or didn't love him or didn't want to be with him. And yeah. Um, nobody wanted to hear my side of the story. Uh, they were all in grief and trauma and, yep. you know, I certainly wasn't going to push anything on anybody, but it did make me feel really uh, so much worse to not have a community in which to grieve this man who I was married to, to, As to not be accepted into, yes, loved very much, crazy love. Yeah. So I wasn't accepted into... The group of people yeah. uh, who were mourning him. I, he also had an aunt, his closest relative, who was actually the first person I called mm-hmm. after he died. Mm-hmm. And she rejected me also, even though I called her. Same thing. She, she because we were separated, she completely rejected me and was mourning with the, the others. And it, it was incredibly painful because I wanted to be with her and hear stories about her and about him and and their life together. And she ended up uh, unfriending me on Facebook. And the only time she talked to me was she wanted uh, some of his ashes. Isn't that interesting? It was Uh, heartbreaking. And you're the second uh, partner that, um, well, I have, I've met, but someone I actually knew and uh, same thing happened, and her partner, they weren't married in that case, but together for years, and he died, and um, I knew him as well, and the family excluded her, from what I understand from her point of view, that they just excluded her from basically everything. It's a very, it's, grief is so weird, and so again, my my deepest, like, condolences for you, for Glenn, but also for you. My heart actually goes out to you to have to have dealt with that on top of everything else and finding Glenn, right? And then it's almost like you don't count and you're discarded, which completely, as you said, disenfranchises you, your grief. It makes you just not matter. And I will guarantee you there's hardly any support out there, let alone discourse on the subject. And we need to make people uh, or help people become aware that everyone is entitled to their grief and should be respected for it. It was years before I, when I went through my grief education course and read David Kessler's book, yeah, that that's when I finally felt like, oh, my grief is legitimate. This pain yeah. I'm feeling, you know, on top of the guilt and the shame, the the rejection of yeah. people who who didn't consider my grief uh, reasonable or or that I, that I wasn't entitled to grieve. Right. Um, right. You know, it. That's when I really started to be able to feel like 
okay, I, I my pain is real and my pain is legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. And now, you know, I help others with that. I, I wrote books about it and yeah. um, I, I work with uh, suicide loss survivors and yes. spouse loss survivors and you know, about yeah. the partner. Yeah. Yeah. And the partner, I think, is a really important point, too. You mentioned that the, the people you were talking about weren't married. Um, right. That's that's another time that can be so tricky, because if you're not legally married, then the family sort of takes over the grieving Yes. And then you're left out like I was a like you were a friend. And that's another level is the friends sometimes get disenfranchised. Well, yeah. you're not family. So and sometimes friends are closer than the family is. I know. Yeah. yeah. So my point is everyone who grieves yeah. has pain and it's legitimate and there is help to find support community it's out there you just have mm-hmm. to seek it even for friends even for people who weren't legally married what you're saying is is so important so i want to acknowledge the work that you're doing without the experience and without going through that and really understanding it you wouldn't be able to help other people in this way um you your lived experience and um so i i well it's horrible you went through that just like i lost all my friends felt totally isolated. I know that part of it. I didn't have the people, you know, dropping casseroles off and stuff like that. I felt very ostracized. Uh, I felt like our house had a great big, you know, black cross on it. And as said, we lived in the country and we didn't know a lot of people in the community, but the people far and wide and even extended family simply weren't there for us. The other piece I want to say is, um, as you were talking Um, and, um, you know, and the families, uh, even if you're the second legal wife, but maybe, you know, you didn't have kids with him. So the first wife becomes more into the fold, you know, accepted into the fold. The only thing I'm going to offer to, uh, both you, Michelle, and, and the audience here is I remember I was very jealous of anybody else grieving my daughter. Now I know it sounds weird, but it comes, I think, from this place of whatever the attachment you have for every individual to the person who has died. And especially in a traumatic death, I think it's amplified. That's your relationship. But those that maybe are closest or feel that they're closest, like so a parent losing a child, right? No one else is going to understand that unless you're a parent who's lost a child. Same with a spouse, so on. And when it gets to extended family and then beyond that into the friends and the work community. And anyway, I felt that no one loved her as much as me. And then so therefore they didn't understand my grief and the temptation and the actual reaction to push them away and even cut them off and certainly set boundaries was very natural for me to do it. And I think that, and then, you know, that that is common when you're talking and that's how we disenfranchise other people ourselves as the grieving. And um, it is very common. Uh, So many of the spouses and not just suicide loss, but all spousal loss, spouse and partner loss. Yeah. Uh, so often the in-laws or the spouse's family yeah, it just cuts them out. It's like, yeah, oh, you're not with yeah. my son anymore. My son's gone, so I'm not going to talk yeah. to you anymore. Right. And so you lose your family along with your identity, along with your partner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, all of a sudden you don't have that same place to go on the holidays or you don't have that, you know, somebody to celebrate your partner or spouse's birthday with because the family's all, you know, when you when what would be ideal is everybody coming together who loved that person. Yeah. yeah. And grieving yeah. together and yeah. and remembering together. And it's just Nobody's at their best when they're grieving. No. And so many yeah. relationships end that didn't need to because friends aren't being supportive. Family's not being supportive. Oh. And it's just because they don't know what to do 
which is yeah. why my big soapbox is grief education. This is how to talk to someone who's grieving. This is how when you're yeah. grieving to keep your relationships going. Yeah. So it's really important to emphasize here, and I know you do work, you know, as you were just mentioning with those who are trying to support and want to support the grieving, but we do it to ourselves. Let's, like you're talking, the family, you, you know, on a scale of, you know, did you have kids with them? Well, then the blood's in him, the blood's in the kids. So we'll accept you in the fold. I see all of these things happening, which is making me really, um, for the first time, literally understand grief is very instinctual. And to me, it's just a very basic instinctual reaction. It's not a response, reaction. But the problem is people get trapped in that. And that's the work I do. Yeah. When you're in pain, you don't hurt people, hurt people. Exactly. So you're suffering, you're in pain, you want to be seen, you want to be supported. Yeah. And then those other people who loved him or her are suffering and in pain and they want to be seen and they want to be supported. And people are so shocked because the people that they should be getting support from in their mind Mm -hmm. aren't supporting them. And so instead of just, okay, they can't support me right now, I'm going to go find someone who can. Yeah. They blow up the relationship. Absolutely. And it's like, I was going to say, it's like the cat chasing the tail. You know, it's never going to stop. And also when you are immediately impacted by a suicide um, and any other sudden traumatic death, you know, but we're really talking a lot right now about suicide. It's like, so you don't expect it. You have no warning. And even if you do sort of something's wrong, you know, like it's, our brains are not really wired to expect a suicide. We pray to God nothing's going to happen. But certainly for me as a parent, I might have been worried and I was worried, but I didn't know about what. And it never even crossed my mind my daughter would take her life because I didn't think she would hurt me like that. And yes, I know, audience, it isn't about them um, thinking that way. They're not thinking in that moment of suicide who they're going to hurt. And even if they are, they're not going to have that at the top of the list. You know, they got to end the pain that's happening. That coming from psychiatrists, not me. And that's a really tough one to accept. And that's where the letting go of what you think you could have, should have done can happen is really understanding you probably can't stop something that's going to happen. But I believe and do work in the um, area as well where we need to feel at least we tried. And that's where awareness and communication comes in and knowing how to even talk to your loved one at risk and calling them on it. I'm a huge proponent of, you know, are you, are you thinking of ending your life? And um, that's my approach with a child. And I have absolutely raised my uh, son, who was 13 when his sister died, uh, completely differently. Uh, but for years, I thought I was like a really bad mom. You, you know, spouses might think they were a really bad spouse, you know, because they couldn't save the loved one and all of that. There's blame uh, oh, yeah. from in-laws. Oftentimes, the in-laws are like, how come you didn't stop that? Oh, my God. Really? Oh. Because it's, yeah, I've heard, I've heard some things, let me tell you. Um, but oh. it's because the, for the in-laws, again, hurt people, hurt people. The in-laws yeah. are suffering so badly because yeah. they lost their child. Yes. And they are lashing out. It is mm-hmm. easier to blame than it is to feel your pain. So if you complete yes. fingers and externalize the badness, yeah. and you don't have to feel it quite as deeply, you can turn your your grieving pain into hatred for your daughter-in-law, which, who is now no longer your daughter-in-law because her husband died. So it's, yeah. You're seeing, saying something really important. So I'm going to ask this question for myself and the audience. Are you legally, when your husband died, when Glenn died, you immediately be, stop becoming a daughter-in-law? Or is this more a social construct? Legally, yeah. I mean, his parents weren't living. I'm, I'm not giving a personal example with this. Legally, you're no longer a part of the family. I mean, of course, if you have children, then those are still their grandchildren. Yes. 
but you, but you as the individual, the relationship severed, cut off, boom. And so then it really does depend on the relationship you had to the in-laws, how uh, they're impacted by their adult child's death, uh, how much control they want over remembering him or her. You know, it's, it's really about this ownership of I need to preserve this, this child um, in the way that only I can do it because I know them the best. Right. Yeah. Everybody, everybody's yeah. in pain. So yeah. nobody's acting compassionately or yeah. in anyone's best interest. Yeah. Oh, wow. So let me ask you this moving on a little bit, uh, Michelle. Um, um, first of all, did you, did you ever repair the relationships with the in-laws or was that severed permanently when Glenn died? With, yeah, with his, uh, his parents, his family. Yeah. No, it wasn't his parents. His parents were both passed away. It was his, his aunt. So the family, just let's say his family. So that was severed. So you have to grieve that as well, which you alluded to before. You have to grieve that and all the other secondary losses. And, um, that I think, yeah, we um, we need voices in that area, which you're obviously offering your voice and educating and advocating for support in this area. I'll just say this: it 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 took me a number of years to accept this uh, concept that everybody had a relationship with Jenea, and their grief matters. It to them, it's as painful as mine is to me. And I'm not going to lie, it took me a number of years to accept that. You know, you can intellectually sit there and say it, but it's completely another to mean it and live it and honor the pain. The only thing I'm going to add to that, and I have said this over the years, is we are not usually the best support for each other in the family because... Um, we don't necessarily understand and nor should we, no one can understand in my family what it's like for me as a mom, uh, bereaved, and I can't understand for them what it's like as a sibling or as an auntie or an uncle or anything like that. So it takes a big person and a big heart. You've got to open and make room in your heart. Wouldn't you agree, Michelle? Yes, but you also have to be a certain amount down your healing journey before yeah. you can open your heart. Because at yeah. first you're just like an injured animal. Oh, for I mean, sure. You're not thinking with your higher self. Yeah. You're yes. thinking, I am suffering. Yeah. Why isn't everyone taking care of this? Why isn't yes. anyone helping me? Everybody should be paying attention to me and my pain. Yes. And then there's yes. all these people in pain around you. Yeah, and they're all oh. thinking the same thing, right? Oh my goodness, the same way. Yeah. So the best work that we can do in order to provide support for our loved ones is to heal or get as I don't know that we ever actually heal, but what? get as far down the healing journey as you yes. can, yeah, so that you can reconnect with your compassion and your understanding mm -hmm. for the other people who are in the same, who are also grieving. Yeah, and that's work. It takes, oh. like you said, sometimes years. Oh, lifetime. The other thing is also if you have to be the first to make a change, to do something, to embrace healing for the family, I was the first and remain the leader in my family. Uh, and this is especially crucial in the first few years. I'd say the first for us 10, because the family fell apart. Everything, everything falls apart, like you're saying, Michelle. And when you're in the family, um, and yes, in pain and then angry and all of, you know, there's numerous emotions. So you're not really able to look at them, dissect them, do inner work. I was because I had a spiritual practice at that point for 23 years. I was already wired that way. But had I not been, and also I became an angel therapy practitioner right away. So had I not done that, I'm not sure I'd be on the planet, truthfully. Really not sure. I understand. I'm not sure. When a yeah. primary relative dies by suicide, your suicide risk escalates. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I had my son to live for, but I'm being honest here. I'm talking. These are feelings. These are feelings. We don't necessarily act on them, 
But the isolation we feel, which is huge even within the family, within the, the, you know, the partnership, and, and there's just so many compounded factors, uh, each unique to every single person and that family unit, no matter who has died by suicide. But it does take 100%, I agree with you, it takes that certain, um, you know, level of healing uh, moving forward, you can't, in my opinion, you can't really move forward without healing, but I'm using the word gingerly because I still know people today, years later in their grief that don't like the word healing. I didn't like it for a number of years and I didn't want anyone to tell me, oh, maybe you can heal one day. Shut up. Don't tell me that. I knew myself I could, but I didn't want anyone else saying that. So I say that respectfully within our grieving community that, you know, any amount of willingness to just be a little bit better than, you know, today than yesterday, that is what eventually allows us to be able to open up the dialogue with the ones around us we love very, very much who can't communicate. So if you end up being the leader of that tribe who can open the conversation, even by saying what you're feeling, it's a start, right? And yeah, it's a start. And in the end, I think um, ultimately, except for our, our younger surviving children and maybe even a little older ones, I, I just, you know, I took it on me as sort of a responsibility as a parent to um, make sure the family remained intact. And it, it doesn't mean I got everything right. I didn't. I grappled for years and years. And today um, it's still not right, you know, but it's our broken little pieces mended back together and I still believe that sort of how I am functioning influences the family it's a very small family thank god because I wouldn't want to be influencing too many people but um I you know but I think that's like when we're talking families here someone has to kind of take the reins and almost steer if there is a family unit in grief, steer that family through it. That's, that's kind of, it's been my experience. I may be completely, it may not be anybody else's, but that has been mine and I have owned it. Um, so for you, Michelle, um, I did want to, I know you talked a little bit about, um, with me earlier about losing your mom. So I do want, not want to skip over that. You said that was also very difficult uh, death for you. Did that, did she pass before or after Glenn? Before she yeah. died in 2007. And so is there anything, again, even though we're sort of more focused on suicide here today, but um, knowing and respecting that was a difficult loss for you, um, is there anything you want to share with the audience about um, about losing a parent or maybe somebody else, um, whatever that, however that impacted you and what you've, the lessons you've learned from that that you want to share? Some of the lesson is similar in that uh, when my mom died, I was very, very sick because I hadn't been taking care of myself. I'd only been focusing on her and my anticipatory grief, which actually started uh, three and a half years before she died. She was diagnosed with an aggressive form of leukemia. Oh. And the three and a half years were full of barbaric treatment. You know, I mean, I bless the doctors for trying to save her life, but it was it was a really, really rough few years and leading up to that time before her diagnosis I mean, when she was diagnosed my kids were one four and seven and I relied heavily on her presence in my life we were mm -hmm. we were every day several times a day on the phone dinner together several times a week you know we were really really close and she was helping me so much get through this early motherhood Mm -hmm. uh, which, which was incredibly difficult and demanding. And then all of a sudden, I had two more people to take care of because my mom was sick and my dad was also in, and you know, grief from my mom being sick. And so it, it really turned my life upside down. Yeah. And I did learn a lot uh, that the three and a half years were, I didn't learn a lot during that time, except some of the lessons you and I were talking about, like I remember a really good friend of mine had not reached out or, you know, a lot of people were offering, can I drive your kids here if you're, cause I was over taking care of my mom a lot. So yeah, I was getting a lot of help with childcare. And one of my friends stopped me in the hallway one day at, at preschool and 
She put her hand on my shoulder and looked me in the eye and she said, I know I haven't been around much, Michelle, but Mm -hmm. it really upsets me to see you cry. Oh, yeah. So in this moment, I learned my that was my one of my first lessons of people who should be who I feel should be supporting me can't. Right. That, that lesson, you know, at the time of my mother's death, I was just sure I would never go through anything so hard. Yeah. You know, uh-huh. any nothing yeah. that happens in my life going forward would yeah. ever be this painful. And then, of course. You know, I go through a divorce and then I remarry and then he dies by suicide. So my mom's death did open my eyes to the possibilities of people not being able to support who you feel should be supportive. So I, I had a little lesson in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. and that, I believe, helped me a little bit after Glenn died, just knowing. So I, it wasn't as shocking. Yeah. Yeah, it's you're you're saying something so important, and so just me thinking back to our experience in uh, 2005 and up to really kind of 2009 when I actually was able to go back to work, and I'm not going to talk about that at all right uh, here, obviously. But um, the more I, the stronger I got, and the more I had to get back out there in living for a bunch of different reasons, but obviously earn some money, pay the mortgage, that kind of stuff, you know, the more empowered I kind of felt, the more I kind of started to make decisions and stuff like that. Um, But, you know, so, but not talking about that today, what you're talking about, anticipatory grief is a real thing. Just learning about anticipatory grief, I think, it helps people understand yeah, because you feel guilty and you feel all kinds of feelings like I wish they were already dead because they're in so much pain. Well, how horrifying is it for me to wish that, you know, people go into a, sh- a shame spiral because they felt like they wished their loved one was just out of pain, but that's wishing them dead. And, you know, yeah. all of these feelings are natural parts of anticipatory grief. And if we can educate people about that and Because feeling shame doesn't do anyone any good. Feeling guilt, that doesn't help your loved one feel supported when they're going through whatever illness is taking their life. It doesn't help you get through your grieving process. The problem with that, Michelle, is it's it's really, really difficult to pin down what you're feeling, number one. And I uh, started a few months ago using an emotion wheel absolutely amazing and I also started working with a life wheel so I'm working with the two uh, at the same time because we'll always have triggers so I mentioned to you before the podcast this summer was a little difficult for me it was my daughter's 18th anniversary I've also lost both my parents uh her biological father his sister you know there's just been numerous deaths and so um I still when when something sets me off or I'm just off, uh, you know, out of balance. Uh, but mostly it's if something has set me off. I will go to that. If it's if it's significant enough, I will use the emotion wheel and narrow down in that pie chart that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and go, what exactly am I feeling? Once you know what you're feeling, people, then you get to decide how long you want to really hang on to it. And, you know, it might be something that can be dispensed with in minutes or a day or two, but understanding the piece, what I'm trying to say here is really understanding what we are feeling, what is triggering us, helps us let it go because we can talk and we're not going to, but we could sit and talk forever about shame and guilt and regret, but people just kind of pay lip service to it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. When my daughter died and I went down and trained as an angel uh, therapy practitioner, I, I, I certified with Doreen Virtue at the time and there were about 400 of us there. So people, we all did readings for each other and stuff, but I had uh, a couple of readings and someone, you know, who was already uh, in the, in the practicing uh, said to me, she was so wonderful. And she said, you know, your daughter wants you to give up the shame. What shame? I don't feel ashamed because that's kind of a dirty word. Shame is associated with a lot of stuff that we're not talking about today, but almost all suicides trigger shame in us. Uh, So I've read And so we push it away because even if you want to take the emotion of anger 
or blame or any of these tough, nasty emotions, revenge, you know, got to get that court case and get them, you know, all that. Well, none of us feel proud to be feeling these things. So that is another reason we don't talk about it because it's very, very, even filled with hate. We don't want to admit even to ourselves that these feelings and emotions, emotions, the feelings that accompany the emotions, the physical response, how you're acting out, right? That this could exist within us. But guess what? It does. So you know what? I learned years ago, honor it, respect it. And hey, if I want to get mad, I'm going to own it. I'm going to be mad. I'm going to let that energy out. And then I'm going to go, okay, maybe that wasn't my best behavior, but I needed to get it out. I mean, you just have to release the anger in a way that isn't destructive. Right. And and I'm talking about just things that, you know, if you're living with someone, they're going to annoy you. There's going to be some conflict. When you're, again, with your family and learning these signs and triggers, knowing who doesn't like conflict, okay, but we need to talk about it, but then you need to state it in a different way. Being sensitive to how we're all responding to things and what the same triggers might be when we can't necessarily be the sounding board for each other. Um, you know, it's, it's, you, you, you just have to, um, learn and gauge the longer you're in this experience, uh, where your safe spaces are, who you can talk uh, with about it. And if you want the honest truth in mind as a parent, my safest space is talking to other bereaved parents. It's not my family. Not my family. No. Okay, so we've covered so much here, and including the anticipatory grief piece, which thank you for sharing that. That is an episode all on its own for sure. Um, but it, it plays into, we've talked a lot about uh, support, lack of it, and, and, and acknowledging the support that is out there. And I do want to talk uh, to you a little bit about Camp Widow, which is uh, for spouses. But if you could just explain... Um, you know, a little bit about what this is, how it helped you. And I know it is located in a few uh, different areas in the States and somewhere in Canada. So whatever you want to share about it. it and Australia. Oh, and Australia. How amazing. So people like they could go to the website maybe for Camp Widow and find out if there's a location near them. But let's talk about that because that's an amazing resource. Whoa. So Camp Widow is put on several times a year. Uh, all over uh, the country and, and the world what? by an organization called Soaring Spirit, which oh. was started by a young, young widow who lost her husband suddenly, another Michelle. Um, oh. And she, she realized the, the lack of support for widows, especially young widows. Yeah. And this organization, Soaring Spirits, has grown into a global uh, group that can mm -hmm. offer support for any widowed people. And that means any widowed people. So you don't have to have been married. You, mm -hmm. you don't have to have been together long. And maybe mm -hmm. you realize 10 years after your loved one died that you are, haven't grieved them or you don't know how, or you want a grieving community. Mm -hmm. And so several times a year, Several hundred people get together at Camp Widow and all of the yeah. presenters, the speakers, which I've been a speaker one time there last July, nice. um, are volunteers. Mm -hmm. We volunteer our time uh, and give a presentation. Uh, I also taught yoga uh, to the kids, which was fun. And the grown-ups. Nice. I guess I taught a couple of yogas. But, um, nice. And so it's just this really incredible three-day experience where there's tons and tons of tons of information speakers you can pick uh different like you know tracks depending on how long ago your loss was or just depending on all these different things and so you can really meet and then there's a meeting time with groups of people that have similar loss oh and it, if you are a widowed person it is even if you're repartnered which yeah. is another thing that i think is is so underserved you're repartnered, but you're never going to stop grieving your yeah. prior relationship because you still yeah. love the person. As long yeah. as you love them, you're going to grieve them. And the love lives forever. 
So there is a spot for that. People actually bring their new partners and the repart the partners get to get together and say, how the heck do we stay in our, you know, ha- promote our beautiful, lovely relationship and help our yeah. partner grieve their previous relationship. And yeah. so it's, it, and there's tons of information on their website. I think it's soaringspirits.org. Okay. Uh, and there's there's groups on there that you can join. And yeah. so it's not just Camp Widow. There's, yeah. there's They're starting to create packets to go to hospitals and hospices and things like that with information oh. for the newly bereaved. And oh. yeah, it, it's a wonderful experience. If, talk about it like it's the opposite of disenfranchised. You know, oh, everybody wow. there gets it. Everybody yeah. there feels and understands what you're going through. Yeah. The concept is just fabulous. And I'm so glad you found that because it did help you, right? Very much. I made a lot of connections, you know, yeah. people that I'm in touch with. And I, I will go back when I get a chance. Yes. Um, maybe as a presenter, maybe just as a an attendee. And it, it yeah. is the most wonderful energy by the by the time I mean even in the first few hours you're there you just feel so connected to the group I know I'm a big proponent and I'm sure you are of community can be very hard to reach out people especially in newer grief I understand it but um, I reached out right away and and had a community and I swear they also saved my life Um, We are at the top of the hour, Michelle. I want to get to your resources uh, to end up uh, with. But one thing uh, I'd just like to talk about just for a minute is uh, before that is what is it in your uh, mind? We've talked a lot about the difficulties of of being, you know, a spouse and certainly uh, secondary losses. But is there one or two things that you um, want to leave the audience with that people just don't get about spousal loss, whether it's related to suicide or spousal loss in general? Well, I think I touched on some of the pain points, the yes. uh, losing your identity, losing your roommate in most cases, and yeah. the you share your, your joys with and your bills with, and maybe yeah. losing a big chunk of your family. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that the when you're ready as as a bereaved widowed person, mm-hmm. the thing that can help the most is doing some introspection as to who you are and how you want your life to go because you you do have to make those decisions without a partner. And some people repartner yeah. really quickly, mm-hmm. um, but I, you know I I've been alone now seven and a half years. I, I have not repartnered, not by choice. I just haven't found a person um, that that I feel is the right partner. Yeah. So I have really had to make a life of my choosing on my own. And there can be blessings there. As much as I pr- would have preferred Glenn didn't die, uh, creating my own life is a, it's a very rewarding process. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other thing I'd really, really like to emphasize is for people to just be kind to yourself. You know, yeah. we've talked a lot about shame and guilt and yeah. and all of these things. And, yeah. you know, if you can just choose a way to be kind to yourself and not beat yourself up, mm-hmm. your healing journey will go better. Thank you for mentioning that because um, with the emotion wheel, it's really interesting so at the center of it, I think there's seven emotions, right? And um, well, there are a number of negative ones. We need to remember, well, it doesn't appear there are equal number of positive ones. And I've talked to therapists about this. Where are all the positive emotions? Anyway, dig down and it, it, it can be a wonderful tool as well. And there's a bunch of free ones online. So you just search Emotion Wheel. And I am actually starting to talk a lot more about this because it helps us at least understand how we are feeling and how we want to feel. So you can go and look, uh, you know, and, and, you know, sort of intend for yourself, I would like to experience more joy. Okay, well, what does joy actually mean? What would you feel when you experience joy? And, you know, look down in that pie and um, create little things in your life that will help you feel that way. And I just did an interview with someone and one of the things she does, and I'm going to be sharing it a lot because it's so amazing, is find at least one thing that brought you joy today. 
And that is very different from what do you feel grateful for. Joy, it actually puts a, an, a, a connection to, oh, that made me light up. Or, oh, I feel so joyful because I could taste my tea. You know, science is proving that we can rewire our brains to yeah. be more open to joy yeah. by that by using that exact practice. And so we can actually make our lives more joyful. And it's kind of uncomfortable to talk to widowed people or bereaved people about joy, but it is a really important part of the healing process. All right. So listen, you've got a beautiful background there and you've got your books uh, set up for my uh, for my uh, YouTube audience. You're going to be able to see that um, beautifully illustrated for the uh, listening uh, audience. Michelle, can you just uh, uh, tell us what the names of your books are? And um, obviously, we're going to have a link to your website so people can find your resources, the books included, where to purchase them on your website. Uh, and uh, and then tell us a little bit about the services you offer. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so the books are Surviving Spouse or Partner Suicide Loss, A Mindful Guide for Your Journey Through Grief. That's the nice. first one. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's mindful guide is because my uh, take on everything is through the lens of my using mindfulness to suffer mm -hmm. less mindfulness practices. So, yeah. and then the second book, supporting a survivor of spouse or partner suicide loss, a mindful guide for co journeying through grief. And that book had to be set out. I actually uh, uh, released them on the same day. Yeah. January of 2023. Yeah. Because I felt like the supporters, you know, like you and I have already talked about so much in this hour, people don't know what to do or how to help someone yes. who's lost a partner to suicide. Yes. And so it's a very specific guide. It has much of the same information as the first book, but so that it, ideally you read it together with your friend yeah. who lost their, your friend or loved one who lost their spouse or partner. But it can really educate people to what to say, what not to say. You know, that yeah. whole, oh, you're young, you'll repartner, oh. you know, oh, yeah. right? You yeah. know, um, it, yeah. it's, it's all of those things. What what do you say? Well, this book will help you know what to say and what to do. And it's actually sold better than the Survivor book. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. So those are amazing resources. And then what services uh, are you providing, Michelle? Well, I work with bereaved people, of course, uh, suffering grief. Uh, but I also, so as a, as a grief coach and a wellness coach, I also end up with working with a lot of people who are suffering from uh, not just grief, but anxiety. Okay. Uh, of course, a lot of grief comes with anxiety. And then I'm also a yoga therapist. So I do this really holistic, comprehensive practice to help people learn mindfulness practices, health practices, uh, self-love practices, self-compassion, meditation, all these things to help improve their entire life. So it's not just focused on grief, although that is a specialty. Yeah. And I am, you know, I'm very deep into the grief with my clients. Yes. Um, but I'm able to, and I also have a neuroscience background. So I use modern science and ancient wisdom mm -hmm. to help each. And I, I really, I work with groups and, and sometimes corporate, but the individual one-to-one -one practices, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I really love to do that because I can tailor it exactly towards each person. Exactly. And I have some courses out on my website that are wonderful, highly recommend, very affordable courses that are just recordings. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also work with corporate, so I'll, I'll work with HR to develop uh, bereavement programs because nice. when someone comes back, oftentimes bereavement is three days. I know. And you people know. don't know what to do. The employees don't know what to do. I mean, they're showing up late to meetings. They're crying in the bathroom. You know, all of yeah. it. So if we have a program in place for employees to understand, not just the employee who's coming back, but for all of their coworkers to understand what to expect and that, yeah, this person is not going to be on their game for a while. 
Yeah. And you may need to pick up the slack, but what they've been through is really, really hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, we need, uh, I'm in Canada, but we need uh, better policies. We need better, you know, education uh, for uh, employers, both government, private. And I had to uh, go, I was working for the federal government and it was actually a very interesting experience because the employer I ended up with, um, you know, they got me and I put in work accommodations on a yearly basis until I actually ended up on a disability. And uh, they worked with me, and then that disability led to my retirement. And it was very, very difficult, and we don't have time in this uh, episode to talk about any of that, but um, that was such an empowering experience for me, having to teach them with the help of a therapist, right, to give me the courage and understand what I needed uh, to educate them and uh, deal with HR and, you know, and deal with the union and know my rights and, and be empa- feel empowered enough to ask for them. And um, that was really interesting. And I wouldn't want to have to go through it again. And I'm, I don't know the policies of the states and stuff like that and private companies, but the government was very, very, very good. And I had a good job, a really good job. Uh, and they accommodated me. And you know, what I want to stress here is when we end up working with limitations, so my limitations, basically, uh, my mental and I had a lot of il- illness, chronic illness, right? And but I was a, a, a top notch, uh, you know, employee. And so I could still produce, perform and produce at a record level that could accommodate my sick leave when I needed to be off. And, you know, so I was that A plus personality that would take myself. And then of course the body breaks down when you've had enough and your way, however, your body's going to tell you, you can't function at that speed anymore, whatever. Um, you're going to feel it and you're going to know it. And, um, so I don't think any of us really kind of get away from, what the mental and emotional stresses we live with does on the physical body. It's a lot for people. So we don't have time to talk about that today, but I'm just saying the more you are aware that you can and likely are being impacted by your grief that you might otherwise say, oh, is stress or it's this bug or it's that or yeah. Um, grief produces lots and lots and lots of effects, uh, mental, emotional, physically, and spiritually. So you have amazing, uh, resources, Michelle. It has been an absolute delight speaking with you today. Thank you very much for sharing your experience, your story, your uh, resources, all you do to help the grieving. It's amazing. Is there any last thoughts that you have? I guess I would just say to your audience, if you have not found a community in which to grieve that feels supportive, keep looking. You can send me an email. I'll help you out. Um, Go to griefgrief.com. It has 25 different small groups for different bereaved, uh, different types of death and different ages and it including a suicide group a spouse loss a child loss mm-hmm. mental poisoning i mean so many oh, wow yeah. you can join this group called tender hearts and it, so there is a community out there keep looking yeah. until you find a way that you feel supported yeah and your uh website inhabitjoy.com yes Okay, so we'll have a link uh, to that in habitjoy.com to get in touch with uh, Michelle for, as she said, a wealth of resources and uh, in any way that she could help you on an individual or, uh, uh, you know, maybe business corporate uh, level. So thanks again, uh, Michelle. It's been absolutely amazing having you. Thanks. Thank you for having me.